All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and pipeline or CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the other side of the country by Gregory Offner. How are you doing, Greg? Hey, John, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and Gregory is known as a globally recognized expert on performance, the founder and CEO of the Global Performance Institute and an award-winning international speaker and event MC. Also spent 15 years in internationally renowned, renowned dueling uh, piano bar performer, uh, performing professionally on five of the seven continents. And uh, for those of you who've never seen it, it's uh, that's when you, right when you have two people, grand pianos, dueling with each other. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it Back started... Started a long time ago with jazz musicians. In fact, there's a great movie, something about 1900, The Legend of the 1900 or something. Um, and it really is interesting how dueling pianos merged quickly out of the jazz scene and into the pop culture scene. The 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 common understanding of what a dueling piano show looks like comes from a bar called Pat O'Brien's uh, mm -hmm. in the early 1900s down in New Orleans. And not much really has changed. It's two pianos, generally three piano players throughout the night that cycle in and out. Two of them play at a time and and they they kind of perform head to head. Sometimes they accompany and, and support each other. Other times they're battling back and forth to try and one up each other. But the, the real goal isn't to find out which of the piano players is the best performer, but to make sure the audience has the best right. time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it all goes back to the customer at the end of the day, doesn't it? It sure does. It's about creating that experience that people want more and more and more of. Yeah, yeah. And that's where you've created the tip jar culture, which helps transform the employee experience or take the, as you like to say, take the arc out of work. And the tip jar culture, your book is coming out next year, I believe, right? Yeah, that's it. And I mean, that's such a great connection that you're making there because it really is. We We spend a lot of time in the business world worrying about customer experience. And we have chief customer experience officers in some organizations, but we very rarely think about the employee experience. We just sort of call it work. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, because we've let work kind of languish in terms of the experience, it's now become, uh, well, I mean, it is a four letter word, but it's a thing that people don't really enjoy. They don't look forward to. They try to avoid in many cases, like I'll be the first to say, I used to schedule dentist appointments when I knew I was supposed to be at the office. <laughs> yeah. You know, if the doctor needed to see me, it needed to be at one o'clock on a Tuesday so that I could get the heck out of there after lunch. And it just shouldn't be that way. The, the, the place or the thing that we do or the place that we go for eight to 10 hours of our day for the majority of our adult life shouldn't be something we dislike. Right. So here's an interesting, so it's interesting that, that you say that, uh, Gregory, because let's face it, I mean, we were talking about customer experience and customer experience, everybody's talking about it today and you know, it has to be end-to-end -end customer experience and every touch point and all of that. The reality is a lot of those touch points are with human beings and they're with people in your organization at different points. So, so back to your point, if you don't have engaged employees, if everybody's not aligned on the same page, enthusiastic, all of that, there's going to be moments in the customer experience when they're going to interact with somebody who's going to give them a different experience and perhaps interacting with someone else. Yeah. Tony Robbins likes to say that people don't get their shoulds, they get their musts, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I take that and I adapt it for business, right? Because the truth is employees get exactly what they believe they're owed from their employer. The question is, will they take it from the employer? Will they take it from the customer? Mm. How will they take it? And I'm sure you can think of this example in your own life. I know I saw it firsthand when I went to a bar a few years ago with a buddy. We reconnected over a couple of drinks, probably had three rounds. At the end of the night, I got charged for one drink. That's not because I am incredibly good looking. Uh. This bartender was not trying to take me home. This bar trainer was trying to get me to make up that difference, the savings mm -hmm. in the tip. Right. They weren't getting what they believed they were owed from that job. Now, admittedly, some of that comes down to a mindset of the employee. Mm -hmm. And that's part of this tip jar culture framework that I share. It's, it's not all, hey, the employer bears the responsibility of fixing work. Work sucks. Employer, that's your problem. No, mm -hmm. there's also a development need on the employee side that work should be about impact and income 
follows that. We have too many employees that are obsessed with income yep. and couldn't give a damn about their impact. <laughs> and what's, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. What's really interesting, Gregor, though, that you say that is that I do think oftentimes we approach things as employees from the company needs to do everything for me. There's nothing, you know, I just need to sit back and wait. And I always sort of say to people, you know, nobody cares about your career as much as you do. Mm -hmm. And nobody cares about your experience. So what are you doing? And I think this is the thing is, you know, people too often, and especially employees too often, wait for things to happen rather than to be a little bit more proactive and meet halfway and be, in, be open about it. And I think you have to create that, you have to create that environment, but you can't let, a, you know, think that it all has to come one way. Exactly. There, so there's a psychologist who did a study in the 90s, and he found there were three components of engagement. And one of them that we don't really talk a lot about is capacity, mm -hmm. the ability. Um, stick with me on this example. I used okay. to sell uniform services for a large, large company. They, people who wear workwear to work generally wear this company's clothing. And in our sales calls, we used to ask the prospect, Hey, Mr. Prospect, just random question. What do you think about when your pants are too tight? <laughs> and they'd give us a crazy look like, what? It's like, you know, you got, maybe you're supposed to be in a size 40, but you're wearing a size 36. You know, what's going through your brain? And of course they'd say, well, my, my freaking pants are too tight. Everything <laughs> hurts. It's constricted. That's capacity, right? And so if the employee is at capacity financially, emotionally, physically, they got nothing left to give in terms of employment. Mm. So in that instance, it, it is the, the responsibility of the employer to try to keep their employees physically, financially, emotionally in a state where they've got more to give. So that mm. means effective pay, not giving money away, but sure. giving me an opportunity to earn more by being worth more to the organization. Mm. Emotional capacity. The thing most employees don't know how to use is their, their mindset. I won't say their brain, but their mindset, how to manage their own psychology. It's not often taught in schools and we've got huge for most organizations, huge learning and development budgets that we spend to teach people how to do the job. Mm. But if we help to develop people and the first place we can start is understanding how to manage their mindset, their emotional well-being they automatically have more capacity to do better at the job. Yeah. And I, and I think what you're saying there as well, Greg, is this idea of the first place is learning how to manage yourself, right? And nobody is taught that. You're not taught that. In fact, you know, in fact, when people are promoted to managers, the first thing they're, you know, they're taught is how to manage other people. But again, they're not taught about how to manage themselves. They're not taught how to manage upwards uh, either. And I think that's such a critical starting point is realizing that understanding that managing yourself is going to set yourself up for success. Yeah. There are managers who have been surveyed. They had more than 10 years of experience. They reported having less, less than one year of training. Mm. I mean, that's astounding. Less than 10% of their time was spent being developed for how yeah. to do the job. And yet, if you look at pro athletes, 70% of a pro athlete's time is training to play in game day scenarios. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to flip the equation and spend more time developing our people to do the job so that when they do the job, they're more effective. And I mean, take sales as a great example. Sales organizations that don't just give you the pitch book and say, here you go, get out there, make it happen. But they bring you in for ongoing product development. They put you in situational scenarios, right? We call it role playing. Yep. When you role play those sales calls and in great sales organizations, those role plays are fun. They make mm -hmm. them wacky and zany. They have people that are trying to distract you and make it harder than it will be on a real call because when practice is harder than performance, performance becomes fun and you yeah. get better at it. And and the other thing too is it's it's a it's a strange um, psychological thing a trick your brain will play on you. But later on, if you do a simulation or a role play or whatever, your your brain actually doesn't differentiate later on when it recalls it. It doesn't say, "Oh no, that was a simulation, that was a role play." It recalls it as an actual interaction, you know. And therefore, to your point, is if you're practicing, practicing, training constantly, reinforcing all of that you're recalling it as experience. And so it's helping you every time you, you go into, into a call. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So just tell me a little bit about this, the genesis of, of your uh, of your tip jar culture concept. Like, how did you come up with that? And then how did it parlay into a book? So I came up with it on a call with another speaker friend. I originally called this program the performance agreement because there is an unspoken agreement between the audience and the performer. It's an yep. I'm I'm here as the performer to give you an experience that you want. And you're there as the audience to give me that same experience. Because what does a performer love more than applause, hearing their name chanted by a stadium to see smiling faces out in the audience? I mean, that, yeah, the check is nice, but that's mm -hmm. what really fills yep. us up inside as a performer. But to get that, I've got to give you what you need. So there is an agreement. It's a symbiotic relationship, if you will, between employee and employer. And it seems like that agreement, you know, in the sense of, a, of, of an unwritten contract, that agreement's been broken. Mm -hmm. for a long time. But being the performance agreement guy never really sat with me as, as the name or the brand for this yeah. idea. And in a conversation with a fellow speaker about a year ago, he said, what about tip jar culture? And I thought, oh yeah. <laughs> because what I've learned, John, is that I thought working at, at piano bars, that it was just about getting the tip jar full. Yeah. If the tip jar was full at the end of the night, that meant it was a successful night. But that, that was only a small part of the equation. It's not really about what goes in the tip jar. It's about the tip jar itself. It's that the environment is designed so that discretionary effort yields discretionary incentive. Mm. I know that if I give a great performance, I will get things that are valuable to me in return. That's the tip jar culture. And when we create an environment like that at work, John, People want to come back. I, I, you know, what's fascinating about that, uh, that uh, I was just thinking there, Gregory, is, you know, that whole concept of if I give, if I give great performance, if I create great experiences, if I maximize my impact, I am going to, something is going to come back to me. Um, how many people are sitting in organizations today saying, yeah, I could do that but nothing would come back to me or it wouldn't even get noticed or I it would just be taken advantage of or whatever. Um, so how do you create then, how do you create an organization that is able to enable something like this? Yeah, it starts with conversation because the change is permitted, right, from the top down, but it is provoked from the bottom up. Right. And so there has to be conversation. So I am predominantly speaking when I go on stage to leaders or to aspiring leaders, because they're the ones that I need to buy into this concept. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm so passionate about this right now is because I think we're at a critical point in, in the workforce. The pandemic exposed a great lie that had been told to employees for at least a decade. And that lie was, we can't have everybody working remote. It's yeah. just people wouldn't work. We'd yeah. lose our culture. We'd lose our values and nothing would get done. That exposed the lie. Yep. The pandemic exposed. Well, actually, no. When it when it when your profits and your bonuses were on the line, executives, right, as a whole, well, all of a sudden it's possible. And so now people are wondering what else is possible? What else have we been told about this experience we call work is a lie? Right. And if we don't take action, and I'm speaking to leaders now, if we don't take action and address this very real concern that employees have, that all of this is a house of cards and it's all just designed to get us to work harder. So you, this amorphous collective of uh, a big brother sitting up in an ivory tower, so you can make more money, it, it's all going to come crashing down. So we've got to address it now. Yeah. And, and no, I, I, I totally agree with you because uh, we actually uh, started, we went virtual, largely virtual as a company many years ago, strategically, because we actually saw it as a way of, of having, uh, you know, getting the best people and then creating the culture and the environment for them to be able to work together in. And I think that's the part that's changed hugely. And a lot of employers haven't cottoned onto this yet, though. And it started even pre-COVID. It started even around the financial crisis is that people suddenly woke up to the fact that why should I go work for you at that company where you have a physical building? I have to locate myself either close to that building in a high mortgage, high cost area, or have a horrendous commute from way out where it's affordable. And people realized at the end go, 
maybe I just need to go find the best place for me and then go find a job, like find mm-hmm. a virtual job. So it's it's switched. So if you're not attuned to that as an employer, you're missing out on a lot of talent. Yeah. And it's never been easier for that talent to go and set up their own shop to, you know, as my dad would say, to hang their own shingle. Now yep. that we've got peer-to-peer payment systems like Venmo and PayPal, I mean, they're basically everybody, basically everybody has PayPal or Venmo. Yep. And we've got Wi-Fi is pretty much ubiquitous. The cost of computing has gone down. So it's, you know, I remember when your company had to give you the laptop because the thing was so damn expensive, but now pretty much anybody can get one. It's never been easier to start your own business. And a lot of folks are staking out and doing that. They're saying, I'll take 30, 40, 50% cut in pay to be able to make my own schedule, to make my own rules. Yeah. And maybe take it. Yeah, no. And and I think... And and even beyond that is not even sort of stepping away. And it doesn't always have to be financially. Like we had somebody, we have somebody in our organization who a while back said, and, and during the COVID said, I need to get away from all of this and I need to take my kids. I want to go to Thailand for two months, right? Um, their job as project manager allowed them to be able to do that and continue their job, like without missing a beat. Mm-hmm. How many, you have to ask yourself, how many organizations would say, yeah, but I don't really care where you are as long as you get your job done and you have access. And if you're happy, then we're happy. Well, that's <laughs> part of the problem that many employees have is there's no way to tell when their job is done. Mm-hmm. And that's also, yeah. that does rest at a managerial level. It is very hard work outside of having a sales quota for a leader to say concretely, yeah, here's the job. And when it's done, you could leave. Like, remember when we were in grade school or in high school and we'd have an exam and they'd say, yeah, when you're done the exam, see ya. Like the rest of the time is yours. Yeah. We loved that because it used to be when we were really little, when you're done the exam, sit there quietly, put your pencil down, put your head on your hands and just wait for everybody else to finish. Oh my God, what a waste of time. Can I read a book? No, you can't pull out a book because you might be cheating. So don't do that. That's what work feels like. And we all know that it shouldn't and certainly doesn't have to, but that only changes when leaders get on board Mm -hmm. with creating the change that needs to happen. Um, Or they're going to see what you just described, which is employees heading for the exits, doing their own thing, working wherever they want, whenever they want. It doesn't have to be that way. There's a lot of value in working for an organization. I think namely that the organization has this huge opportunity to train and mentor and develop people. Yeah. I mean, most organizations are led by senior executives who are millionaires or in many cases, billionaires. Could you imagine just as an example, if Jamie Dimon taught a personal finance class, right? I mean, it it, it could be virtual, but if it were only available to JP Morgan Chase employees, oh my God. Yeah. But but to your point, though, that's not, uh, you know, it's not a lot of organizations thinking that way, thinking about how can I create an ad, added value for, for, because every reward you give doesn't have to be financial, as we said, you know, it could be, it could be exactly what you just said about getting financial course from Jamie Dimon or being allowed to go work for two months in, in Thailand, it can be different things, but you need to be, as a leader, you need to be aware that these are issues. Yeah. And so my work starts with a question. What do you want in your tip jar? Mm -hmm. And initially people, people say money. It's sort of our default response, money. I I want money. Or maybe I want a promotion, which Mm -hmm. often people equate with money. Yep. But money in and of itself isn't valuable. Like this piece of paper isn't valuable unless there's information on it. Mm -hmm. That information allows me to do something. So what is it that money, more money would allow you to do? That's a deep question that managers generally aren't asking of their people when they hear, well, I, I need I need a raise boss or I'm going to this other job. How much do you need? Well, I need yeah. $5,000. What would an additional $5,000 allow you to do? Right. I mean, your employee will be gobsmacked when you ask that question. They won't know how to respond. Yeah. Well, I can tell that- you for me, the most valuable tip I ever got, the one that I remember at least, was a back rub. <laughs> I was at the piano bar and it was a Saturday night and a woman came up to me And she said, I was here last night and I put $10 on the piano with my request slip. I wanted you to play uh, Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. That's a tough, Mm -hmm. that's a tough song to play. And for whatever reason, we didn't get to it. Maybe it was too late in the night. It didn't matter. But the the tip went in our jar, right? So so the money was there. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's, that's a, that, that song's a huge lift. And I'm not saying you didn't leave the $10. I'm just saying, she goes, look, here's the deal. I'll sweeten the pot for you. I'm a licensed massage therapist. If you play that song, 
I'll rub your shoulders while you play it. I thought, lady, you got a deal. Because piano, we, we spent most of our night like this with our hands on the keys. So my shoulders are killing me. I will never forget that. That was more valuable to me than anything in that moment. Right. And we as employers, we have the opportunity to deliver that to our people. Our people want transformation. Mm-hmm. They want to become better tomorrow than they were today. And that doesn't necessarily mean more money or promotion. It could mean, for example, an employer providing negotiation skills training. Because everybody negotiates, or at least should be negotiating, mm-hmm. when they buy a car, when they buy yep. you know big ticket furniture for their house, when they buy a house. But most folks, unless they're in a sales role, are never trained how to negotiate. Yeah. And, <laughs> and in many people in sales roles aren't trained how to negotiate <laughs> either, true, true, uh, unfortunately. But isn't it, Gregory? That's a, that's a fascinating point uh, that you make there. Because again, as we said, is you can you can bring all sorts of value to your employees that may seem you know, that don't seem like such a big lift, like just what you said there, these simple negotiations training for everybody because they have, because we all negotiate in our lives. Uh, that's a really easy, simple thing to do that immediately brings value to everybody. Mm-hmm. That's the, the, the power of that question. What do you want in your tip jar? Mm-hmm. Is, is, it's one that I wish I could mandate leaders and managers ask their people regularly. Yeah. Yeah. Because like I said, I mean, as you, as you point out, you know, we always default to money. And to be honest, that's why oftentimes people go for promotions. It's not because they want to be promoted particularly, or they want particularly love the job that they're going for. It's because they, it's because they want the additional money. And I think just one of the last point is, is we have failed in many ways because that is seen as the only career path for people, right? Is, to become a manager, move up, promote it into managing people. We don't value other things enough and say, you know, you can have a career path where you can excel, but you don't have to manage people because not everybody's good at managing people. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but we've sort of set that up as the only career path. Yeah. Corporate, corporate life has become less about performance and more about endurance. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. And that's, you know, I, there's a chapter in my book where I say, look, I have no problem with CEOs making millions upon mm-hmm. millions in bonuses when they get it right. Yep. If they're willing to take the loss when they get it wrong. You right. brought up 2008 earlier. Mm-hmm. That was another sort of big reveal moment when many employees at the ground level went, wait, so when you get it right, you get it right. And when you get it wrong, you get it right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there needs to be that accountability and that willingness to say, okay, look, let's make work work for everybody, not yeah. just for the folks who win the endurance race and somehow wind up in a senior leadership role and they go, cool, thanks for the payday. We've made it. Mm-hmm. Work should be about solving problems profitably. And I yeah. think we've gotten too focused on the profitably and not focused enough on the solving problems. And when we get back to solving the problem of making work work for everybody, Organizations who do that, they've created a tip jar culture. Yeah, no, I, I had an interesting experience a number of years ago when I was running a, a, a couple of organizations for, for a parent company. But um, one of, what I did was, obviously, salespeople, uh, they got great commissions and all of that. They were fine. They were selling more. They were making lots of money. But it was everybody on the operational side. Uh, you know, they didn't, they didn't really have variable com- um, you know, comp. So what I did, I said, well, the company is actually measured on its operating profit at the end of the day. So it's not just bringing in revenue. It's also bringing in profitable revenue, right? So I challenged the operations side of the equation. I said, okay, let's see how we can reduce expenses. And, and then if, you, if we hit certain targets, then you get paid a bonus because we hit our, op, our operational, um, uh, whatever it is, uh, profit targets. And then the, you know what they started doing? They started talking more when they were interacting with the salespeople. They started talking about profitability of deals. They started talking about how they could save money on not doing this, but doing that. And before you knew it, we had this whole symbiotic thing going on because everybody was being rewarded. And now because everybody was being rewarded, everybody was being uh, productive and trying to find ways to maximize uh, maximize the profit by and still deliver the value. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're talking about collaboration, John. And that's another tenant of the tip jar culture. That request slip is a vehicle for collaboration between the audience and the performer. When we align incentives, we create the space that invites collaboration. Yes. 
Yeah. And, and if you don't, um, then, you know, you can't expect people to collaborate just out of thin air. It doesn't happen organically. Some people will, some people won't, but you have to create the environment, as you said, and you have to incentivize it. Mm hmm. Well, listen, Greg, this has been fantastic. All of Greg's informa Gregory's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Gregory, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Yeah. So I spread the message of the tip jar culture via keynotes and corporate training workshops um, for leaders and exceptional organizations all around the world. I bring the piano with me. It's easy. Ooh. It's simple. I've got it down to a science, just like Billy Joel and Elton John. And we create an experience that not just talks about these principles, but models them in front of attendees. So it's a fun way to experience education and leave with an idea that can transform the business itself. Yeah, I love it. So it's, and if you've got any keynotes or any conferences or whatever coming up and you want, uh, you want these fantastic insights and some piano to go along with it, Heck yeah. Gregory's your man. <laughs> so, uh, hey, listen, we've all sat through enough. Uh, let's face it, we've all sat through enough boring keynotes at like eight o'clock in the morning after being out late the night before. You need something a little bit different. So how about Indeed some piano playing? <laughs> That's it, John. All right. Well, listen, thanks, Gregory. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon. Yeah.